We can't hear anything on Zoom. Let me know when. Okay. Uh, all right, folks. Uh, I think the first few slides are light enough that it shouldn't be an issue. Make sure you sign up for attendance. We're going to continue with our series on recurrent neural networks. Specifically, we'll be talking about sequence to sequence models. We've uh, seen this in the past last week. This is a problem where some sequence of inputs goes in and a different sequence comes out. So it's a time series problem. We started off saying recurrent neural networks were appropriate for time series, right? So classic problem, speech recognition, where what goes in as a speech sequence of speech vectors, what comes out as a sequence of words, or machine translation. Now this begins to get more strange because what goes in as a sequence of words, what comes out as a sequence of words, but then it's not clear that this is, this is actually a uh, classical uh, pattern conversion problem or in a dialogue system where what goes in and what comes out may not be related at all. So in all of these cases, the uh, uh, key is that the number of symbols that goes in, the length of the sequence that comes in, may not be the same as the length of the sequence that comes out. And we saw this specifically for the case of speech recognition, the upper pro the problem on top, where a speech recording goes in and the transcription comes out. Now, what was uh, special about this problem is that the output has an order correspondence with the input, meaning the portion of the output that corresponds to the word I, in my example, will come before the, por the portion of the input that corresponds to the word I is going to come before the portion of the input that corresponds to the word uh, eight, and that comes in turn before the segment of the speech that corresponds to an, and so on. So this means that you can align the output to the input. And that's, in fact, and, and so there we were able to convert this problem where the output was a different length and not time synchronous with the input to a situation where the output was synchronous with the input by in introducing the notion of an alignment. And then once we did that, we were able to train our models and we were perform able to perform inference. So this was, uh, that's how we, we handled this problem. This one is more challenging. Not only is there no restriction on the length of the output here, the length of the output may be more than the length of the input. There is no clear correspondence between the output and the input. So in a machine translation problem, I ate an apple could become Ishaba and an apple gegessen. It's a slightly poor translation to German, just to illustrate a point that uh, I maps to Ish, but when you look at eight, eight actually has two siblings on the other side. Uh, Anne goes to Einen, and then apple, has, has, apple goes to Apfel, but then again, the order on the output is not the same as the order of the input. There is no correspondence that you can actually see. Now in this particular example, maybe you can even sort of see a word level correspondence, but what about something like this? My screen is blank in a dialogue system. And the response could be, can you check if your computer is plugged in? What is the correspondence? There is no apparent correspondence over here. So how do we deal with these problems? The situation here is that the input and the output may have no correspondence. But before we do that, we're going to look at a slightly different, but somewhat related, actually very related problem. And to give you an idea, so we're still speaking of recurrent neural networks, right? Look at this piece of code. Static int indicate policy void, open parenthesis, open curly brace, the code is complete, right? 
And uh, in fact, if you went through it, this would compile and it would run. So I'm not sure what it would do, right? Completely clean source code. Uh, here's another example. This was a piece of uh, what looks like a mathematical proof. And uh, completes, comes complete with, you know, lemma, proof, lemma, proof, uh, a LaTeX. This is all in LaTeX, which has been compiled. So you can actually see that whatever LaTeX generated, this is complete, right? Now, or here was a full Wikipedia page about something or the other. So we've seen all of these. These are really crappy examples at this point of time for what neural networks can generate. I mean, the things that we see these days are chat GPT, right? Which is uh, uh, pretty amazing. But the examples that we see so far, in fact, they are very trivial examples. And this is something that you could train on your laptop in about 20 minutes. These were trained off, uh, generated by a simple recurrent neural network with two layers of LSTMs, that's it. Uh, and uh, all that happened was that in Andre, Andre Karpathy trained these, in this case, on, uh, uh, I think, the Linux source code and let it run. And look at how just such a simple model has learned enough structure to generate something that's almost perfectly valid code. It knows to close each parenthesis that, op that was opened, close each brace that was opened. Uh, it's a phenomenal amount of consistency. And the fact that chat GPT can e do even better uh, may not seem particularly astounding to you, but it must, it must, right? It, it's learning a lot, lot about the structure of the language. So what are we doing in these examples? Or even when you're looking at uh, your latest large language models. You're modeling language. And in the specific examples we, that we just saw, we were modeling language using recurrent neural networks. So what does it mean to model a language? A language model models the probability distribution of token sequences. I'm using the word, I'm, I'm using the term token generically over here because your token could be words, it could be symbols, it could be characters, it could be anything, right? Uh, and so language models learn the probability distribution of token sequences in the language. And once learned, these can be used to do different things like compute the probability of a given token sequence or generate sequences from the distribution of the language or from the conditional distribution of the language. In fact, every time you're using any of the large language models, it's basically just a language model, which is generating or drawing a sample from a conditional distribution that has been particularly well learned. So what exactly then is this language model? Every, put, every sentence, every token sequence, every sequence of characters that you see is actually an instance of a sequence, that's it, right? And so a language mo in, in the case of a language model, this sequence represents a language of some kind. And now if you take any language, be it English, be it, be it computer programs, be it you know, the language of mathematics, there is a probability distribution over all possible sequences. When you generate something from that, some things are more frequent and some things are less frequent and some things are just never going, are just never going to happen, right? And so the language model is actually modeling the probability distribution of these sequences. Of, it's a probability distribution of entire sequences. But then, and so again, this is something that you really, really must remember, that the language model is not modeling the probability distribution of individual tokens or individual words. It is the probability distribution of sentences in the language effectively, right? which sentences are more frequent and which sentences are less frequent. Now, the way we would normally do it, however, is to decompose it. So if I've got a sequence W1, W2, W3, W4, then I can use Bayes' rule to decompose it as the probability of W1 times the probability of W2 given W1 times the probability of W3 given W1 and W2 and so on. And so you sort of decompose it into the incremental probability of the next token given everything in the past. So this is always predicting the next symbol given previous symbols. Regardless, you must remember that even if uh, we decompose it in this manner, we are eventually 
actually modeling the probability distributions of entire sequences. But the sequences could be sentences, para paragraphs, books, what have you. They're modeling language. But then once we say we are going to decompose it into the problem of always predicting the distribution for the next symbol in the sequence, then we reduce it to something like this. Four score and seven years. If I asked anybody here, what's the next word? What is it? Mm. Ago, right? You are certain. A, B, R, A, H, A, M, L, I, and C, O, L. What is the next character? You know it's N, right? So you're predicting, once you know enough of the context, the next one seems almost evident. Now, it doesn't mean that the next one is always going to be N. Maybe there's a guy by the name of Lincoln, but you know, it's highly unlikely, right? So, so this is what we're going to do with the network. We're going to learn to predict the next symbol in the sequence given the past, but keeping in mind that the business of predicting the next symbol in the sequence is actually an, X, an integral component of predicting the probability distribution of entire sequences. So how would we go about doing this, predicting the next symbol in the sequence? First, our symbols must be converted into some mathematical form so we can represent them as one hot vectors. If you're working with dic dictionary words, then you can represent all of the words in the dictionary as, as in some lexical order. And then once you've arranged them in a lexical order, every word in the dictionary is going to become a one hot vector. And if you're working with characters, similarly you can convert all characters to a one hot vector. The issue here is that the length of the vector can be very long. If you're looking at, the Engli at English, the dictionary can be 100,000 words before it's fully functional, so the vector is going to be 100,000 dimensional one hot vector. If you're looking at Russian, it's going to be longer still. It's going to be order of 400,000. So they can be long. But if you're working with characters, that's only 100. And now the problem of predicting the next word in the sequence simply becomes this. You're given some, the first n words in the sequence, all represented as one hot vectors. And your network is a function which must now predict the next word. So. If I were to draw it as a block diagram, this is what it's going to look like. W0 through Wn minus one go in, and Wn comes out. The issue again is the dimensionality. These one hot vectors, as we said, are very, very large in terms of components. So why would we want to use one hot vectors in the first place? Now, if I were to assign anything other than one hot vectors, then you have this issue that you're, there's a notion of a distance between vectors that you're imposing. Now, vector, when vectors are one hot, what is the distance between any two one hot vectors? Anybody? Okay. They're all the same. What is the exact value? Square root of two, right? So each vector has length one. They're all on the surface of a sphere, really. And uh, they're all, the distance between any two vectors is square root of two. So you're not really assigning a geometry to the words. You're not saying this word is closer to this word and this word is closer to this word. And this makes sense. You don't want, in the apps, you know, you, you can think of your computer as coming in agnostic to any real world, and any uh, priors that, uh, about what is close to what. And in that situation, the best thing you can, you can do is to set up the words so that the distance between any two words is the same. But then this comes with a problem, right? Your yeah. one hot vectors are all living on some corner, specifically uh, the uh, little dots that I've shown, not even on the corners of a hypercube. The one hot vectors are all living are, are occupying a single point on one axis in the space. So if you've got a, uh, can you shut your laptop? Of course. It's okay, fine. So if you're, if you're, uh, if you're lib looking at a 100,000 word vocabulary, then your space is going to have 100,000 dimensions, and every word is going to be exactly one point in this 100,000 dimensional space. 
And this means that this 0, 0, 1, for instance, could represent the word the. But then if you perturb it from go and go from 0, 0, 1 to you know, 1 epsilon delta, where epsilon and delta are infinitesimally you know, small numbers, that point suddenly has no meaning, right? So they're all meaningless points in the space. We are so our space is essentially unoccupied, except for a tiny number of points, you've got this extremely large space, then it's fully unoccupied. That's a problem we can't really deal with. Uh, we can't really uh, do anything about because uh, by definition, words are discrete, right? But then if you can think about it another way, if I look at the density of points within the unit cube of any length, it's going to be very sparse. The number of points per unit volume is going to be minuscule. So what we can do is to try to fix at least one of these things. We can try, try to increase the density of points, to increase the efficiency with which we use the space. And the way we would do it is to project the points into a lower dimensional subspace. And the way you project it is to multiply a one-hot vector by some linear transform that lowers the dimensionality. In the process of doing it, you would actually be projecting each one of these points into a plane. And so the act of projection is simply going to be multiplying your one hot vector by a projection matrix P. And if you do this properly, then the distances between the projected points could potentially actually capture the semantic relationship between words. Now, how can one do this? This can be learned from data. Now, this business of projection is simply multiplying the one hot vector by a projection matrix P, which is a linear layer, as we all know, in our uh, neural network. So every one of these would then be multiplied by some P before they go into the network, which then predicts the next word. And of course, P is a linear layer. So the entire network now becomes a shared parameter network where all of these linear layers share parameters, right? And the whole thing can be, whole thing can be learned. So in terms of learning, how could the learning be performed? One simple model is a convolutional model, a, ti a time delay neural network. You can say that the, ne the words in a sentence are predicted by the past N words, right? So in order to find out what the next, next word is, you just have to look at the current word and the previous N words, and that should give you all the information. If you do that, you'd have a model of this kind where every word, in this case, I'm looking at the past four words for, to predict the next word. So this is a convolutional model where every word is being predicted based on the previous four words, except that prior to prediction, each one of these words, which is a one hot vector, is going through the projection matrix P. And so P is a shared uh, component of this network. And P is also going to be learned. And P is what is going to be projecting the one hot vectors down to the lower dimensional subspace. And this can, of course, be learned. There are other models. So the model to the left used to be called a soft bag of words, where uh, you're, you'd be predicting words based on the past few words and the subsequent few words. Because the idea here is that in order to understand exactly what a word is, both the past and the future carry information about it. Or you had these things called skip grams, where you would be using a word to predict all the neighboring words. And there were various other permutations and combinations that have been uh, proposed in the literature. But then in every case, the uh, situation is that Prior to making your predictions, whatever is being input is passed through this, through this linear layer, which is the projection matrix. And then the model is trained. So once you train it, training, of course, is simple, right? Uh, here, for example, you're using all of these words, W1, 1, 2, 3, and 5, 6, 7, to predict W4. Uh, what the network will actually output is a probability distribution for W4 which you can compare to the actual W4 in your sequence, and then you're gonna get a loss and you can back propagate the derivatives. Or if you had this uh, other model over here, at each time, you'd be, you'd be inputting w, W1 through W4, and the output probability distribution is gonna be compared to W5. 
the, the input would be w through to w5, two, two through w5, and the output distribution is gonna be compared to w6. And the cumulative loss over all of these predictions is what you're going to be back propagating in order to learn the parameters of the network. And sure enough, once you learn the parameters of the network, if you look at the projections of the words, so what does W times P times W look like? What does the word look like after it has been projected to the lower dimensional space? It turns out that you end up learning semantic meanings. And it's a very trivial thing to be, trivial model, right? This used to be very popular for a while. These days, of course, uh, we, are, we still use the same concept, except the manner in which we learn these projections is a little more uh, informed. So uh, here, this is from Mikolo's 2013 paper. They find that when they use this simple skip gram structure to learn uh, the lower dimensional representations for words, you learn structures of this kind. Uh, they're showing two-dimensional principal component analyses of the words that you, that you see. And you can see that China, the vector that connects China to Beijing is the same, or more or less the same, as the vector that connects Russia to Moscow, or Japan to Tokyo, or Turkey to Ankara, and so on. It seems to have learned the relationship of state and capital, which is a very unusual thing for it to be learning, right? Uh, but it has learned this entirely from data. They have other examples where they show how man minus woman is the same as king minus queen, and so on. So here's our first poem. So, who's indigo alligator? Do we have indigo alligator in class? No? So, who, who's coral turtle? Yes. Uh, I think the first three. The first three are correct. So the distance between two, any, any two non-identical one-hot vectors is the same, right? And words are represented as one-hot embeddings because these do not impose any a priori assumption about which words are closer than others. Now, uh, when we project it down, the resulting vectors are what we call word embeddings. You must be very familiar with this term by now because you're encountering them all over the place. And word embeddings derived from the language models are lower dimensional real valued representations between the dis where the distance between words is a meaningful representation of their closeness. It just sort of pops out of the learning. And low dimensional word embeddings, and do they enable you to find representations of words that were not part of your vocabulary? They don't. We learn nothing about words outside the vocabulary, right? So the first three are good. Okay. Now, continuing on, if you're modeling language. So here's how uh, we would be modeling language. We're going to be assuming that this business of projection is part of the deal. Then every word is going to be projected down by the projection matrix P before it's, being, before it's used to predict the next word. Again, when we are modeling language, we are learning to predict the next word in the sequence. But again, what is it we are really modeling? We are modeling the probability distributions of entire sequences of words. Now, if we were using a recurrent structure, this is what the uh, model is going to look like. You'd be feeding in entire sentences, but at each time, the model is going to be trying to predict the next word. So you don't need a specific train, uh, you know, input and output as part of the training data, the output, the predicted output is part of the input itself because at each time you're simply predicting the next word. And because at each time you're predicting the next word, 
the output distribution at each time can be compared to the next word in the input sequence, and this can then be used to train your model. Now, once you train it, how can you use it to do things like generating that piece of code that we saw earlier on? This is the simple business of synthesis. At each time, let's say I just gave this network, you can seed the sequence, right? You can give the network some sequence of words. So let's say I gave it W1, W2, and W3. Then given W1 to W3, through W3, it's going to predict the probability distribution for the fourth word. And from this distribution, you can draw a word. And once that word is drawn, that word can be used as the next token in the sequence because you generated the fourth word. At which point, using this word, it's going to generate the, compute the probability distribution for the fifth word, which you can draw from that distribution and feed it back in and keep doing this to uh, generate, continue generating sequences. Now, you can continue this process till you terminate generation. In some cases, like if you're programming, uh, generating, say, code, there's a natural termination for when you must stop generating. Like if you've started writing a program, if you've opened a curly brace, it's going to terminate when you've generated the closed curly brace, the final closed curly brace. In other cases, it's not so clear. So that's basically what was used in this example. This was Andre Karpathy's example where he just trained on Linux source code. You let it run, you generate something like this, right? Or there was an example here which I won't play where somebody just trained a, a network on a whole bunch of MIDI and then you can let it run and it generates, this is just a simple two-layer LSTM and it generates perfectly plausible piano music. It's amazing. But then, more generally, right? Like in the case of the music, if it's not a programming language, if you're not generating code, when do you stop generating? So this also ends up being a key cue. A word sequence by itself does not indicate if it's a complete sentence or not. For example, four score and eight. If you just look at this, it's unclear if this is the start of a sentence or the end of a sentence or both the start and an end of a sentence, or if it's the middle of a sentence. How do we know, right? Now, this could have been just the beginning, saying four score here, four score in eight years. Ah, uh, good. What was that? That was very exciting, right? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody check on this person. <laughs> okay. All right. So this could have been just four score and eight years ago, and this could have been part of the Gettysburg address. Or somebody could be saying, you know, uh, 88 is four score and eight, or is it? Four score is, uh, and then, or uh, in which case it would be the end of a sentence. Or someone could just say four score and eight and be gone for some reason, in which case it's the entire sentence. Just looking at the word sequence doesn't tell you. So what we like to do is to specifically tag these sequences with some additional tags, invisible tags, the start of sequence marker and the end of sequence marker. So an SOS, start of sequence marker, indicates the start of a sentence and EOS indicates the end of a sentence. So if you have something like this, four score and eight without these markers is the middle of a sentence. But then if you have start of SOS, four score and eight, it means that four is the first word in the sentence. If I have four score and eight EOS, that means the word eight is the end of a sentence, but four is not the start of a sentence. And then if I have SOS, four score and eight EOS, it means that it's the entire sequence, entire sentence, yeah. So the EOS would have a probability Yes, it would, right? But not yeah. SOS. Yeah, not SOS. And so SOS, four score and eight EOS is a complete sentence, right? And in some cases, if you want to be, uh, uh, you know, sort of stingy in our use of symbols, then we can use the same symbol for what indicating both the start of sequence and end of sequence. But the point is, the start of a sequence must be tagged, and the end of a sequence must be tagged. And gen specifically, when I'm generating, uh, when I'm modeling language, then the start of sequence tag will have meaning. There's a chalk here. In assigning, apparently no, okay. 
the start of sequence marker will have meaning in as a conditioning term. So when I see P of W given S or S, I'm literally, literally saying what is the probability that this word could be the first word in a sentence. EOS is almost never going to be a conditioning term because once the sentence has ended, there's nothing more that follows. But then you will have assigned probabilities to EOS. What is the probability that the sentence could end now, right? And so when I'm generating sentences or text, at each point, I'd be generating a probability distribution and drawing a word from it. And I would keep continuing this until I eventually draw an end of sentence, and end of sequence marker. So here's a second poem. Okay, who's bronze tiger? Do we have a bronze tiger in class? We don't have a bronze tiger in class. Yes, yes we do, Professor. <laughs> Thank you. Can you answer this one, bronze tiger? Uh, it's the first one. First is a complete sentence. Start of sequence, hello world, end of sequence. The rest of them, the second one is just the beginning, but you should expect that there are more words that follow. The third one is an end. It means that there are other words before hello that you're not being shown. And the fourth is just hello world, means, which means that there are st there's stuff before it and stuff after it that you're not being shown. It's only the first one, right? So having gone through this business of language modeling, let's go back to our problem of sequence to sequence modeling, right? We're specifically looking at, uh, we've already de dealt with the problem where you have order correspondence, but uh, not time synchrony. And so this is the one that we're going to be looking at, where there's no correspondence between input and output. We're not even maintain an order of symbols, like you know, in the case of machine translation, or the, may even the output may seem completely unrelated to the input. My screen is blank, goes in, and what comes out must be. Uh, please check if your computer is plugged in, right? So this doesn't. I've been speaking of, about modeling language. This doesn't really speak like, look like modeling language, right? If you were writing sentences, uh, you know, my screen is blank as you would not be followed by please check if your computer is plugged in, if it were, unless it were coming from a different party. So there's a setting over here. You're converting one sequence to the other. And so the kind of problem model that seems, to, seems appropriate for it is a model of this kind, which is a delayed sequence to sequence model. You'd have a portion of the model that actually looks at the input. My screen is blank, for instance. And so the pseudocode for it, all it does is takes in the sequence of words. I'm not explicitly going to show you the projection matrix for each word that converts it to the uh, embedding, but it's implicit going in. And so this would be the input sequence of words. And from the input sequence of words, you're going to be computing the, recurrently computing the hidden state and when the final end of sequence marker has been read for the input sequence, you're going to have some hidden state value. Subsequently, that hidden state value is going to be seeding the second portion of the network, which just recurrently generates the output sequence. So now this, that would be a pseudocode of this kind, yeah. Uh, so please, like, uh, just like In this case, we'll get back to that, right? Okay. So, well, there's something, this, this model is not all of it, right? Now, if I were to write pseudocode for this model, what you're going, what you're doing is, have, once you have the input all processed and you have the final hidden state out here, you'd be feeding in the hidden state and at each time, uh, you feed in the current hidden state, you gen generate the next hidden state and the output and the next hidden state would go back in. Uh, uh, the next hidden state would go back into the next time, time instant. This kind of 
the thing is that, again, at each time, what you're actually computing is an output probability distribution from which you're generating words. The uh, problem with this model is this, something that Karthik just alluded to, in that the uh, information being passed only considers the hidden state from time step to time step, which is not entirely okay. And the reason for this is that, uh, for example, if at this time, remember, this business of drawing the next word is like drawing from a probability distribution. It's fundamentally non-deterministic, right? So for example, if I had a probability distribution, if the network said at some time that both the word A and the word an were equally likely, then you're equally likely to draw both A and an. But at the next word out here, if you had drawn the word an over here, the next word must start with, an, with a vowel. If you had drawn the word A, the next word must start with a consonant. That consideration is no longer being used, right? because the process of generating the second word does not in any way influence the third word because the only information being passed is the recurrent state. So uh, this, so if you've drawn it was A, the probability that the next word is dark is going to be the same as if you had drawn it was an, and clearly that will not do. So we're gonna modify the model a little bit. At each time, we're going to feed the word that was drawn back into the model. But the moment I begin doing this, something interesting happens. Does this, what would this model, what does this model look like? So here's what the whole process is going to look like. Uh, let's say I'm looking at machine translation. So then I have the input portion of the model. It's going to take in the word sequence, I ate an apple, end of sequence marker. And then it's going to process it. And eventually when the end of sequence marker is read, it's going to generate a hidden state. Then subsequently, I have a second component of the network, which is going to take this hidden state from the uh, portion of the network that process the input, the I ate an apple. And then it's going to generate a word sequence from it, like so, right? This hidden state is going to be fed in along with the start of sequence marker, because again, remember, that the first word in a, in a sequence is the first word in a sequence. It is being indicated by the fact that preceding it just before it was a starter sequence marker. So it's a conditioning term, right? And so you have a starter sequence marker. And then it generates some word ish. And then that goes in along with a recurrent hidden state. And then it generates a word habe and so on. And this will continue till the end of sequence marker is generated. What does the second portion of the network look like? Have we just seen it? <coughs> Anybody? LSM. It's an LSM, but have we, see, have we just encountered this in the lecture today? Guys? If you've been paying attention, doesn't this look like the language model that we just saw? Right, when I was speaking of modeling language using a recurrent model, what did we do going back here? So remember this? I fed in the first three words and then words kept getting generated until the entire sequence is generated, right? So this model here is doing exactly the same thing, is it not? So what do you think this is? What is the second portion of the model now? It is a language model, right? The second portion of the model is a conditional language model, except that it's being conditioned on the input and not the first few words in the sequence. That makes sense to you guys, right? So. The way we decompose this model, the reason I explain this whole business of language models to you first is that this whole business of sequence to sequence conversion eventually becomes a language modeling problem. You're given a sequence of words, you process it, you get some information from it, and this is a conditioning term that is then fed into a language model, a conditional language model, which learns to generate 
word sequences conditioned on the input. Yeah. How do you ensure that SOS comes after keywords? You don't. That is what you're feeding in, right? So because you're generating an output. Okay. It's being conditioned on the input, and SOS is the first word that you feed in, then you let it run till an US comes through. Right? And of course, over here, because uh, we are drawing things and the output is being fed back in, if I drew a different word over here, because the word is being drawn and fed back in, a different word would be output. Can you guys mute yourselves on Zoom? Okay. Folks on Zoom, you're supposed to be paying attention to class. If you're doing something besides paying attention to class, then you're wasting your time. The least you can do is mute yourself. It's polite. And uh, if this happens again, then from the next class, I will take attendance in class. And if you do not have explicit permission from me to be on Zoom, I will mark you as absent. So please keep yourself muted. OK. Now, in this figure, my hidden state is being shown just by just one sequence of blocks. I don't want you to assume that is that means that there's just one hidden state. There could be two layers of hidden states or 200 layers of hidden states. Uh, that number is not uh, is up to us. It's part of the design. So I'm just going to be showing the uh, I'm just always going to be showing the figure on top. But implicit here is that the uh, hidden state can be arbitrarily complex, right? Then. And so here's what the entire generating process is going to look like. And this is, in fact, just exactly a language model, right? So you'd have the, uh, the input sequence is being processed until an end of sequence marker is, uh, is uh, uh, encountered. And at each time, as it processes the input sequence, it's recurrently computing a hidden state. And then you get a hidden state value at the final time. And then this is passed to the output component portion of the model, which recurrently computes at each time the next hidden state and a probability distribution for the next word, drawn as y of t over here. And the next word itself is drawn from this distribution. Right? And again, the key bit is that the word that has been drawn from the distribution is fed back at each time. So observe that at time t, you're drawing a word from the probability distribution yt that has been generated by the network, computed by the network. And this is fed back as input at time t plus 1. That's the feedback loop that we saw in the figure. Now, this, we like to sort of uh, annotate it as two different components of the network. The portion of the network that processes the input is often called the encoder. And the portion of the network that uses whatever has been computed by the network, the encoder, to generate the output is often called the decoder. And now which of these two is the language model? Decoder. The decoder is the language model. And what is it being conditioned on? It's being conditioned on the output of the encoder. So this model is a conditional language model where the conditioning term is actually be, is the whatever has been computed by the encoder. Is that clear to everybody? Right, OK. So this I will call a simple translation model. We're going to keep making this increasingly complex over the rest of this class and the next class, right? Now, first. The words that go in are not just going to go in as words. They're going to be uh, they're going to be compressed through some dimensionality tra reducing transform into a lower dimensional space, which we call, and uh, the lower dimensional represent representations are what are embeddings. Now, again, if I'm doing something like machine translation, the the vocabulary of English and German are going to be very different, and so the projection matrix that projects the one hot vectors of English could be very different from the projection matrix that projects the one-hot representations of German, right? So those two P's could be very, would be very different in this case. So the exact manner in which you set up these projection matrices is a design choice. For example, if it's a dialogue system, the input and output words are all going to be in English. You would have the same embedding 
matrix. So in a machine translation system, you're translating from say English to German, then the English is going to be projected using one kind of projection, and the German is going to be projected using a completely different kind of projection, right? And what the network actually produces at any time is going to be a probability distribution. So at each time, it takes in everything that it has seen so far and computes the final layer is typically a softmax. It computes a distribution. What does this distribution actually signify? So at this time, at time t equals 1 in the output, what is the probability distribution that is being computed? It is the conditional probability of, of the output, next word, given everything that the network has seen so far. And what has the network seen so far? Anyone? It's, uh, it's, got, it's seen? Encoder output and? It has seen the, and effectively it has seen the entire input and the start of sequence marker, right? And so what it is computing is the probability distribution of the first word given the entire input sequence, which just happens to be represented using this. But the reality is that it's seen the entire input sequence and SOS. And from this distribution, you would be drawing a word, right? Which is being fed back in. Now, at the second time, what is the probability distribution that the encoder is computing? <coughs> yeah, so this, at the second time, it's going to be computing the probability of the word distribution for the words conditioned on the entire input, start of sequence marker, and if, right? Uh, and then uh, the, uh, at the third end, you draw a word from this. And then at the third time, once again, it's going to be computing a probability distribution for words based on, uh, conditioned on the entire input and all the words that have been previously generated. So the key point is that at each time, the model is actually generating a probability distribution for the next word conditioned on the entire input and all the words that have been drawn so far. And that's why it makes it a language model, a conditional language model, right? And of course, this process of computing the probability distribution and drawing the next symbol is going to continue till the end of sequence marker is drawn. So uh, here we have this, uh, I had my code for uh, inference over here, pseudocode for inference. The input is recurrently processed till you get the hidden state for the final input, this one. And this guy is passed to the decoder. And at each time, the initial word, of course, is the start of sequence marker. At each time, the recurrent state is taking in the current word and the previous hidden state to generate the next hidden state and the probability distribution for the next word, y of t. And it is from this probability distribution y of t that we are drawing the next word. But then I've just hidden a lot in this term, drawing the next word. What is this business of drawing the next word? Now, uh, the, uh, that's, where, uh, that's where things get, begin to get a little more interesting. So again, what is the probability that the, uh, process will generate a specific word sequence. Now, at any time, remember that the network is computing the probability distribution for a word, given all words until then, all words in the input, and the words generated so far, right? So at the first time, it's going to be computing P of O1, given all the inputs, and start of sequence marker. At the second time, it's going to be generating P of O2, given all the inputs and the first word. At the third time, it's going to be generating the distribution for the third word, given all inputs and the first two words. So if you've actually drawn a sequence, chosen a particular sequence of words, drawn a particular sequence of words, the probability that it's going to draw that, that you will actually draw that specific sequence of words is going to be the product of the probabilities for the individual words in the sequence, right? And 
the probabilities for the individual words in the sequence can simply be read off the network. So the probability for getting the first word one is simply going to be the probability assigned to the network by the network to O1 at time one, right? The probability of getting, drawing the word O2 at time two, conditioned on O1, <coughs> is the probability assigned to O2 by the network at time two, but this probability, you must remember, is based on the fact that O1 was actually drawn at time one and fed back in, right? And similarly, the probability assigned to O3 is gonna be Y3 O3, which is the probability assigned to O3 at uh, the third word by the network. Again, remembering that this probability has been computed, assuming that the first two words have been drawn, right? And fed back to the network. So, the probability of any particular word, se word sequence is going to be the product of the probabilities of the individual words in the sequence simply read from the output probability distribution compu computed by the network at each time. And when I'm generating an output, so here's the key bit. The language, what we are actually doing is modeling language. We are modeling conditional distribution, probability distributions, right? So the network is actually sampling from the conditional probability distribution of sentences or given the input. And so this process of drawing words at each time is actually the process of generating a sample from the distribution of all possible sentences conditioned on the input. And which of these would you want to choose? Obviously the most likely one, right? And so we want to pick the word sequence such that the product of the probabilities assigned to all the words in the sequence is the largest, right? What is the confounding factor over here? What makes this challenging? It's not about the length. It has to do with the fact that you can't just compute these terms blindly, right? Whatever word you drew over here is being used to compute this probability. The words that you drew in both of these is being used to compute the next probability and so on. So it's not like there's a simple process of simply uh, feeding in all the input, you know, getting the words, feeding it in, and computing probabilities. That's not the way it will work. It's not because the actual word sequence, I can't find chalks. So let's say I have my input, which has been computed, whatever, and this goes in, and I have an SOS going in here, I have a distribution, and let's say I pick the word A, and then I'm going to get some distribution over here, and I get a probability for the word here, right? On the other hand, if I had picked the word after SOS, from this distribution, if I had picked the word, a different word, say do, right? And this went in then this probability distribution here has nothing to do with this probability distribution here. The two have been computed using entirely different inputs. Because in the first case, what went in was ik, in the second case, what went in was do, right? And so, in the, when I compute this sequence of probabilities, each term actually depends on everything in the past. And so if I want to compute the probability distribution, for example, the most likely pair of words, then I can't just run one pass through the network and say this is the most likely pair of words. So this results in, the, this ends up with a bit of a, uh, gives me a bit of a challenge, right? The probability distribution at each time depends on everything that I've drawn so far. And so, and, and I want to pick the word sequence that's most likely, right? So what would be a very cheap solution for picking the word sequence that's most likely? At each time, I could just pick the most likely word. 
then feed it back in, and then pick the most likely word, and then feed it back in. But this won't work. Why so? You know, so this draw could just be, you know, pick an arg max, right? You're going to need a beam search, right? You can't just pick the most likely symbol each time because uh, here's, a, here's a simple example, right? Let's say I'm doing a speech recognition problem. The input is speech. I'm outgenerate, trying to generate an output sequence of words. Now, let's say the first word was the word he, and then at the second word, you had the word nose with the, with the, you know, the, the organ on your face, and the other one was knows with a K, except you don't pronounce the K. And so the two words, let's say they just had very similar probabilities. It just turns out that the word knows over here has a slightly higher probability than the word knows, right? Now the first two words become he knows, but then he knows is a very unlikely sequence of words. So if you look at the word sequence, he knows, what is the next word? There's no obvious next word, right? It's not clear what the next word could be. It's such a, such a bizarre pair of words. And so at that point, the network is going to be very confused about the next word. And so it's going to assign more or less equal probabilities to all the, word, all the words, and all words are going to have low probability. On the other hand, if you consider he knows with a K, then that's actually a very valid beginning to a sentence. And then the network is going to be much more certain about what word could follow. And then in this setting, there are some words which are going to have distinctly high probability, right? <coughs> <coughs> so although nose over here had the higher probability, if I chose nose, then the next word is going to have such low probability that the sequence of third word, three words, ends up with an overall lower probability. Whereas although knows had the high, lower probability, if I had chosen it, the next word ends up with a higher probability. And so the sequence of three words ends up with an overall higher probability. So being greedy is not the answer, right? Because we want to find the word sequence that is overall most probable. And so we've got to deal with that, but then Here's the issue. It's impossible to know a priori which word leads to the more promising future. Should I be drawing nose or knows? We can't really say. And the effect may not be obvious until several words down the line. Just to give you an idea, right? Uh, for example, if, even here, if in the very first word I was given a choice between the and he, and it just turned out that the word he uh, had a slightly higher probability. But if I had instead chosen the, then the the knows is a very valid word sequence. And the knows something might end up being even more probable than he you know, knows something, right? So the fact that what you affected, I mean, what you chose in the first instance ended up affecting the overall probability many words down the line cannot really be predicted as you're going left to right. So how would you deal with this? You don't choose, right? Choosing is bad because when you make any, any kind of commitment, any choice, you end up being suboptimal. And so there are different strategies. One, of course, instead of just picking the most likely one, I'm going to randomly sample from the distribution. How many of you know how to randomly sample from a category distribution? Come on, guys. How do you roll virtual dice? Anyone? This is something that you must all have done in your college, right? Uh, easy one. If I have, there's always a function in any programming language that you choose that's going to give you a random number between zero and one with uniform probability, right? So if I have a probability distribution P1, P2, P3 to sample from where the sum PI is one, then I can take my real line between zero and one. I can partition it, so this, this length is P1, this length is P2, right? 
this length is P3. So this is P1, this portion, this point is P1 plus P2. This is P1 plus P2 plus P3 in my example. And then you can just generate a random number from your uniform distribution. And depending on which bin it falls in, you choose that word, right? Uh, you, so stand, you must, have you not encountered this? You all have, right? Who has not? Everybody must have. So anyway, so one simple strategy would be to just randomly sample a word at each time and feed it back in. And believe it or not, the strategy actually works quite nicely, more often than not. Because you're, you're, you're going to be picking more likely words more often, and less likely words less frequently. But then, and so here, this business of drawing could simply become sampling, right? But here's an, uh, and so in this case, we can just randomly sample a word at each time according to the output probability distribution. But this is not guaranteed to give you the most likely output. Although, this can sometimes give you a result that's better than uh, greedy selection, right? But, Okay, Emerald Leopard, what is the answer to the first question? Who's Emerald Leopard? Emerald Leopard is not present, okay. Uh, who's Olive Hippo? Olive Hippo, what's the answer to the first question? Not present, okay. Uh, who's Navy Lama? Navy Lama. Uh, Navy Lama is me. Okay, what's the answer to the first question? It's true. True, okay. And uh, Red Tiger? Yeah, it's me. Second one? Uh, true. Thank you. And uh, somebody answer the third question. True or false? When was this? Was this on the slides, though? No, we just did this on the board. Thank you, right? The third one was not present on my slides. If you're not in class today and if you're not attending, uh, watching the video, you're not seeing that bit. So here's what we found, that making a choice at any time can get you stuck. If I choose the wrong word at any time, it could actually end up forcing you into a suboptimal choice way down the line, and we don't even know how far down the line this we would have to go. So what would a better strategy be? A better strategy is just we don't choose, right? So at each point, let's say I've processed the input. Then I have every possible output. And then I'm going to restart the network with each one of these words as the output, as the next input. And then again, for each copy of this network, I'm going to get a probability for every possible word. And then I could you know, restart the next time instant recurrently by using all of these words. Every one of these words is the output. And keep growing this till I eventually find a word sequence that ends with the end of sequence that has the highest probability. What would the challenge be in doing this? Anybody? Time. Time? Guys, okay, can somebody from the back answer the question? What would the problem be? What was the question? <laughs> yeah, the back, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pardon me, could you repeat that? Oh, 
Okay, what was the question? What was the problem with what? You have a lot of forking, and so what would that have? What would that cause? It's going to cause an exponential blow up in the, uh, in, a, in two time steps. You're going to run out of memory, right? So what would a potential solution be? Yes. Only maintain like a subset of those, right? So you can do, instead of retaining all choices and forking the network at each time, we can prune. So at each time, you can retain only the top gray scoring forks. So at the very first time, it's going to give you a probability distribution of all the words, right? And let's say I decide to choose only the best two. Then I'm going to, I'm going to knock off everything except the best two. These are the two highest scoring, most probable words. And then the, my copies of the network at the next time are going to be using uh, just these two words. So I'm going to make a copy of the network at each time. But then each copy is going to get one of these two words. In this case, he and the, right? And then at that time, each copy of the network is going to compute a probability distribution of all the words. Now, I have a two-word sequence if I compare, if I consider the output of the first time and the output of the second time, right? And I want to pick the two-word two sequence, which has the highest overall probability, which means that of here I, had, I was maintaining two. If there were V words in my vocabulary, I have two V probabilities, right? But each of these two V probabilities represents a two-word sequence. So over here, for example, everything on top represents the word sequence he something. This is going to be the something, right? And so I'd be multiplying the probability of the first word and the second word over here. So for this one, for example, I'd be multiplying the probability of he and knows. He computed at the first time. The probability of he is computed over here and the probability of knows over here, right? Uh, over here, I'm going to be multiplying the probability of the is computed here and the probability of knows over here. So I'd be looking at the product of pairs of probabilities and pick the two entries with the highest two-word probability. And that's all I would retain. And then the next fork is going to be with the two words that had the highest word pair probability. And then when the next thing goes in, the network is going to output a probability distribution over all words for each of these forks. And then, so now again, I'm going to have two times V choices. And I'm going to pick the two choices where the pro product of the probabilities of the three words in the sequence was the largest. And so I'm going to be picking this entry here, the, the uh, words such that P of O1 times P of O2 times P of O3 was the highest. And those two other ones I'm going to be uh, working out too. And we would continue this. And at each time, you're ne never going to retain more than the top in, this my, in my example two, but more generic, generically, you're never going to retain more than, say, the top K entries, where the probability of the entry is computed as the product of the probability of the entire chain. So this is a classic beam search. And the width of the beam over here is going to be the number of choices you're yes, retaining at each time. Here it's two. And so this is going to be better than greedy. But is this going to be fully optimal? No, right? Because you're, always, you're still making choices, but you're looking at a larger bucket. But uh, with a sufficiently large beam size, this is going to give you something that's pretty close to optimal, right? How long will you continue doing this? Anybody? You would continue doing this until you found an end of, end of sequence marker, but not just any odd end of sequence marker. You have to compute, continue doing this until the product of the sequence of words until this end of sequence marker was the largest. 
right? So you might find, for example, that the product of the sequence of words that comes, this one ends at the end of sequence marker, but this one is still a higher probability. In which case, you can't continue the path on top any further because you've hit the end of sequence marker. Uh, I've just sort of shortened the picture, but the ones at the bottom will continue, right? And, you, and now things get a little more complex in that you might eventually end, hit an end of sequence marker over here, but because this path is larger, you might find that when you consider the entire sequence, this in fact has the higher probability, simply by, uh, because as the paths keep getting larger, the probabilities, you know, they keep ag aggregating, right? And they keep getting smaller and smaller. So eventually you want to pick the word sequence that ended with an end of sequence marker that had the highest probability overall. That make sense? Right? And uh, yeah. Isn't this automatically very different just to long the possibility? Suppose the translation is something that's longer, but. If your model were perfect, it wouldn't be. Your model is imperfect, so it will be. Right? Your model is always imperfect, so we're going to have to throw in some heuristics. But if the model were precise, it actually captured language. Okay. It's not an issue, right? So I have some pseudocode for the beam search, which I will skip. Okay, we have who's Teal Turtle? Uh, here. Okay. What's the answer to the first one? Uh, it's true. Thank you. And who's Olive Hippo? Do we have Olive Hippo? No? Okay. Who's Emerald Woodpecker? Yes. False. Second one is false. Thank you. Right? So we're good. Okay, so far, so far so good. How do we train the system? Training the system, it's very easy, just like before. Uh, let's say I'm doing a machine translation problem. I'm gonna be given training pairs where I'm told what the input is and what the output is. So here, for example, uh, I'd gotta be given instances like I ate an apple, and Shaban and Apfel gave you a sip. Now the network in the forward pass is going to be taking I ate an apple all the way till here and then Something interesting happens here. In your standard network model, here's how we trained our model. You were given input and output pairs, target output pairs. So you'd pass the input to the network and it would generate an output Y and you would compute the divergence between the y and your target output. And this divergence is what you minimized, right? So what would the equivalent be for this kind of a network? If you were to do this. So the equivalent here would be that it would pass in i, eat, and apple. You passed it in through the network, which has both the encoder and the decoder, right? It's going to generate some output, and then you would compare this to ish harbor, blah, 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 and this is the divergence that you would minimize. Does that make sense? Does that make sense, right? So what would the problem with, with trying to do that be? Can you see a problem with this? There would not be any one-to-one -one mapping, right? Particularly when I'm trying in the early portions of the, of the in the early uh, you know epochs of training, the output is going to be garbage. You might want Ishaba and an Apfel Gegesse, and that thing could just generate like a sequence of ten thousand garbage words. How do you compare the two to decide how far apart the two are? So to deal with it, here's what we do: we cheat. 
I'm actually also going to be feeding this to the network. And so this is what we call teacher forcing, in that whatever the network is actually supposed to be outputting is also fed in to the network. And so on the decoder portion of the network, the words going in are not the words drawn, but the actual words that were supposed to have gone in at that time. If you were just treating the network in this manner, then over here at each time, you would have sampled the word ish and put it in, right? You would have sampled the word harbor and put it in. We're not doing that. We're not sampling it from the distribution. We're actually putting in the true word. So it's learning to do the prediction, perform the prediction of the next word in under the ideal condition that all the previous words were currently predicted. Is that making sense? Do you see where the cheat comes in? All of you, right? But this is, we are forced to do so because we, we otherwise, remember, we always like to collapse it to where you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the desired and actual outputs. And so this is how we do it. And then once you do it, you know, forward pass, you're actually going to be giving both the input and the target sequences because the target sequence is going to be part of the uh, inference uh, during training. And then at each time, you'd be computing the divergence between the next word in the target sequence and the probability distribution computed by the network at that time. And this cumulative divergence is now going to be back propagated to train both the decoder portion of the network and the encoder portion of the network. Making sense to everybody? Right. Yeah. And so, in practice, they would use SGD. So instead of using all the words, they pick some random word. So here's the overall training. You'd be given many tra instances of XD. For each training instance, and during the forward pass, you'd be passing in both X and the desired output D. You'd be getting an output for I, and then you'd be computing the divergence between the output Y and D and back propagating the derivatives, right? Many applications like machine translation, speech dialogues, uh, automatic speech technician, image to text. So how does this work? First, a couple of interesting observations in the last couple of minutes before we move on, right? Now, all of this assumes that the encoder manages to successfully capture the essence of the input in the hidden state when the, la when the end of sequence marker for the input has been processed. How well do does it actually do it? There's this very nice paper by Satskever and Vinyals where they show how it works. They project it down to this representation to two dimensions. And they show you a little bit of visualization of how it works. Here were uh, six different sentences. John admires Mary. John is in love with Mary. John respects Mary. They all express this very similar con you know, concepts, so they are all grouped together. Mary admires John. Mary is in love with John. Mary respects John. They express the same concept, but in the inverse, right? And they're all grouped together. And then observe something very interesting. The relationship between John admires Mary and Mary admires John is pretty much the same as John is in love with Mary and Mary is in love with John. John respects Mary and Mary respects John. So locally, each of the groups has the same structure and the translation between you know, pairs is also the same. So it actually seems to cap capture the sentence structure very nicely in both of our examples. Right? Uh, they have a whole bunch of examples in the paper which you can see, and it actually does, this simple model does a pretty darn good job. Okay? You can also use it for captioning images. Once you split things into an encoder and a decoder, remember the decoder simply became a conditional language model. There's no restriction on what you can condition it on. So you could condition it on images. And so in this case, uh, if I just use a convolutional neural network to get a hidden representation out of Im images, and pass that to my decoder. It's going to be generating word sequences based on uh, what it got from the image. And this, of course, can be trained using image caption pairs. So you'd have a CNN to get the image representation. And then you just use the standard procedure to generate the word sequence. You'd use image and uh, caption pairs to train the model. And the very first neural paper, paper on neural 
captioning of images was based on this technique. And you can see it's pretty darn impressive. This is one of our almost 10 years ago. That's an incredibly good model, right? Uh, the first one is man in black shirt is playing a guitar, or construction worker in orange vest working on road. Two young girls playing with a Lego toy. Well, one of them is not a young girl, but still. Mm -hmm. Boys doing a backflip on a wakeboard. It makes some mistakes, like a young boy is holding a baseball bat, surely. <laughs> a cat is sitting on a couch with a remote control, and this one is my favorite. I haven't figured in all these years why it thinks there's a horse in the middle of the road. But still, you get the idea, right? It's a very simple model, not particularly complex, and, it, and uh, it's shockingly good at what it does. But something to note over here, this is a conditional model. It is conditioning, the output is being conditioned on the input, but the problem, we, error we commit is that Whatever it's being conditioned on is being fed only to the first time step of the output. Afterwards, everything is being self-sustained. A more reasonable thing would be for us to pass this information down to every step of the output. And this was, in fact, what is done for image captioning and even video captioning. They had an example where uh, you could pass in a video. This is a 3D CNN and uh, use that for video captioning. But the issue is that we're overloading this guy, right? Can we do better? We'll deal with this in the next class. Thank you. <laughs>